Okay. All right, guys, welcome back. You can turn in your thought questions. Put them up here if you want to. Make sure you wipe off your desk because uh, it's got the bleachy bleach stuff on it. Okay. The search to strengthen the old status quo. Now, basically, in response to the massive and rapid change society was facing, I mean, this is the first time that we have more people living in the cities than in the countryside. So you have rural versus urban. We have incredibly fast and easy transportation, prosperity, uh, as well as increased Eastern European and Asian, as well as Mexican immigration, uh, caused many people to react to try to see uh, what they saw as their social values just fading away. Now, the first thing is prohibition, which we know that a lot of people in Texas had fought for. And basically, uh, this was kind of the last grasp of the Progressive Party. The issue epitomized the culture war that was uh, transpiring. You know, do it for the kids. Basically, in 1917, there was a temporary prohibition uh, because of the war effort in World War I. But by 1918, there's a push for a constitutional amendment prohibiting the manufacture, sale, or transportation of alcoholic beverages. By 1919, it had three quarters of the state support, and the 18th Amendment took effect on January of 1920. And it was one of those deals that it seemed like a good idea at the time, but now that we have to deal with reality, <coughs> not so much so. Basically, it was not popular. And many Americans simply don't pay attention to the law. It grew less popular the longer it lasted. By 1926, only 19% supported the law. I mean, while prohibition did reduce drinking somewhat, it was never well enforced. In 1925, Federal agents visited major cities to see how long it would take an illegal drink. In New York, it took you three minutes, ten seconds. In Detroit, it took you three minutes. In San Antonio, it took you two minutes. And in New Orleans, it only took you 35 seconds. Basically, bootlegging flourished, which was the production and sale of illegal beverages, making Al Capone rich. Indeed, by 1927, he took in more than $100 million, $60 million of it just from bootlegging alone. He would eliminate competition, often violently, with gang warfare. Indeed, Capone got so powerful that he could buy off judges and political officials as he pleased. And when he moved in 1926 to a Chicago suburb, Cicero, he installed his own mayor. Finally, he was arrested in 1931, not for bootlegging, nothing like that. He was arrested for tax evasion, because that's all they could get him on. He was arrested by Al Capone. I mean, not by Al Capone, by Elliot Ness and his Untouchables. A good movie made by Brian De Palma. Sorry, Sean Connery, who's no longer with us.
And then guys, in an incredibly American move, if you can't control the outside world, what can you control? You can control your relationship with God. And basically, fundamentalism was a religious movement that stated that the Bible was the literal truth and every word of it was true. They saw a new theory of evolution as against the Bible, attacking God himself. A populist leader that we talked about before, who was a very powerful orator, um, William James Bryan, said it is better to trust in the rock of ages than to know the ages of the rocks. Well, it's into this that we get the Scopes Monkey Tribe. And actually, there's a Texas connection to this, and I'll point it out in just a second because we're going to talk about uh, two Texans after this. But the Scopes Monkey Trial was when John T. Scopes, a science teacher, was going to try to teach evolution in Tennessee. And in March of 1925, Tennessee had it made it illegal to teach anything but creationalism. Well, they were going to fire John T. Scopes, and the Tennessee ACLU rose up to defend him. And the defending attorney was Clarence Darrow. And the court proceedings were broadcast nationwide. Newsreels would come out and shoot events daily. You'd have a good old fundamentalist with signs like, a monkey's not my uncle. And some people claimed that it was just a money-making deal for the uh, town. But uh, at the end of the trial, Darrow called Brian to, wit to the witness stand as a biblical authority and asked him to explain some passages that he said were contradictory and Brian withered under such interpret, uh, interrogation, finally claiming that all, not all passages were to be taken literally. This is in a movie called Inherit the Wind. It's an old, old movie. But it's good. And one reporter claimed that Darrow never spared him. He was masterful, but it was pitiful. Brian died a few days after this trial. What a lot of people don't know, though, is that Scopes was found guilty. And his firing was upheld. And this law remained on the books until 1968. And the last existing uh, such state law uh, was uh, there until it was finally struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1987. Well, what do we got for us here in Texas? We've got Amy Simple McPherson. Basically, she toured around in her, her quote-unquote gospel car. Preaching the gospel. And instead of like most uh, fundamentalists that were hellfire and brimstone, she was rather optimistic. Kind of like today, I guess a modern comparison would be Joel Austin. And she preached here in Texas for a few years, finally made her way out to uh, Los Angeles and started up a church there. Sadly, though, her death is kind of shrouded in mystery. Um, not sure if she OD'd on sleeping pills or not. But she did, and that was back in 1944. But she did affect many people's lives. Another guy who affected a lot of people, grad from Baylor, 
was J. Frank Norris. And he first preached here in Dallas. Then he went on to uh, Fort Worth, where he opened up First Baptist out in Fort Worth, and it had seating for 5,000 people. This preacher is the father of the megachurch. People hadn't built churches that large before. And he filled them. And, of course, he also started a broadcasting empire. And he tried to join um, Brian on getting school districts to stop teaching evolution. Oh, I almost forgot to tell you that Amy Simple McPherson, she um, toured with Billy Sunday. And Billy Sunday was a back then version of, oh, who's the great revivalist? Billy Graham. And now you guys are going like, who's Billy Graham? Because I don't know if we have a big revivalist now. Do we? And by the way, one of the things that makes uh, Amy McPherson so outstanding is that she was a woman. And there are still some denominations today that don't think that women should be priesters to other men. Ready for the next one? All right, nativism and immigration restriction. Basically, this was a reaction to try to limit immigrants, especially from Southern and Eastern Europe. By 1924, a permanent act, the National Origins Act, limited immigration to 2% of the number of existing Americans who were from the same area. So in other words, if there were a hundred people of English descent, you could have two people immigrate from England. If there were 50 people of German descent, you could only have 50. And of course, if there were 25 Italians, 10 Poles, you would have less and less and less. Once again, and the reason why a lot of people were doing this is because they were afraid, we're losing our country. They don't know what it is to be Americans. Oh, Asians, we didn't want any Asians at all. But it put unrestricted immigration on kind of people from our hemisphere, both Canada as well as Latin America. a renaissance of the clan. The clan which had kind of been pretty much put out by underneath uh, Grant now is making a rise. And on a May 20th, 1925 in Dallas, Texas uh, basically he and about 150 other law officers and a few fire trucks stood in front of a crowd of five to 10,000 people. That's according, well actually, 5,000 is what the Dallas Morning News says, but they always want to make Dallas look like it's calm and everything like that. The uh, Dallas Times Herald said it was a crowd of 10,000, but Dallas Times Herald liked to be a little braggy. So you gotta shoot it somewhere in the middle. 
I'd have no problem saying 7,500 people. Uh, basically, were at the Dallas City Jail, and they wanted the two terrors, which were two black men that had been arrested for uh, basically going out. One happened near White Rock Lake, or actually SMU. Yeah, one happened near SMU, the only one that happened near uh, White Rock Lake. Um, basically, they killed the white boyfriend and molested or raped the white women. And this just happened to take place during a week when we were having a Confederate reunion here in Dallas. Now, how did the Klan get back on its feet? Well, a lot of that is thanks to a guy by the name of Colonel William Joseph Simmons. He was born in 1880 in Alabama, the son of a poor country doctor. He was unable to get into medical school and seminary kicked him out. But he always found leadership in fraternal orders. So in 1915, he decides to lead his own order and he writes a book explaining the rituals and offices of the original clan into his own manual known as the Koran. From 1915 to 1925, the Klan met with a receptive anti-immigrant fever. Jews and Catholics were actually the big enemies of the second renaissance of the Klan. nothing helps them out like a little bit of uh, propaganda. D.W. Griffith had just released The Birth of a Nation. Uh, the name of the book, by the way, that this book, that Birth of a Nation was taken from was called The Klansman. That basically was a huge uh, piece of propaganda an epic film telling the story of Reconstruction, where the Klan was heroes who saved the South. Indeed, this was the first film shown at the White House to Woodrow Wilson, who said that it was like a thunderclap and it got everything correctly. And you know it had, it had all, you know all the Klansmen with their white flowing robes. Klan looked nothing like that in the 1980s. They might have a pillowcase over their head with drawn on co goatees. But Simmons knew how to build off the notion of a heroic clan. And in 1915, Leo Frank. A Jew from New York was put in prison for raping a Gentile woman. He was abducted from his cell and hung. People blamed Simmons, but he said, hey, I had nothing to do with it. And he still needed money. So, uh, by 1920, the Klan hires a professional advertising agent. Atlanta's Elizabeth Tyler and Edward Clark that turned the Klan into a national phenomenon. Oh, by the way, both uh, Tyler and Clark were married but to other people, but they had an affair, got real messy, they ripped off the Klan, the Klan tried to rip them off. And they sent out recruiters called Klegels. And one of these Klegels found his way to Houston, Texas.
Now, basically, Texas at that time was a state in anxiety, hatred, illusion, confusion. A lot of people had no idea what was going on. I mean, the population in Texas was exploding, especially in the cities. From 1910 to 1920, Houston jumped from 78,800 to 138,276. San Antonio vaulted from 96,614 to 161,379. Dallas went from 92,104 to 158,976. Basically, this uh, environment resulted in a condition of lawlessness and looseness. Frightening many white Protestant Texans. In some places, like Houston and Dallas, it was reported that thefts were so numerous that the police threw up their hands and couldn't keep accurate records. Well, if this was the uh, disease, then basically the clan's tonic was reformed. Reforming uh, state and national prohibition laws, going back to Victorian moral standards, getting rid of corrupt politicians and law enforcement officers, and punishing anyone who violated these standards. Now, as much of the city population had moved in from rural areas, the anxieties they felt as they searched for their place in the social order would have found, seemed to have found comfort and refuge in belonging to the uh, clan status quo. And uh, ZR Upchurch took advantage of the spectacle in Houston that had been a reunion of the United Confederate Veterans that took place October 6, 1920. Present was the grandson of Nathan Bedford Forrest, Nathan Bedford Forrest III. And on October 8th, Klansmen in full regalia either rode horses or marched behind in a huge downtown parade. Starting Clan Vernon number one. And from this epicenter, basically the Klan spread out over Texas. And uh, on April 1st, a group of men met that included uh, the exalted Cyclops, Hiram Evans, that abducted a black elevator operator, Alex Johnson, from his home. He was accused of having a liaison with a white woman. He was abducted and taken to the Trinity River Bottoms whipped no less than 25 times. And according to a reporter from the Dow Daily Times Herald, which is the Dallas Times Herald, again and again the whip fell, the Negro groaning. The group wrote KKK on his forehead in acid and brought the shirtless and ragged man to the Adolphus Hotel. And when interviewed about the incident, Dallas County Sheriff Dan Harskin said the Negro was guilty of doing something which he had no right to do. No, there will be no investigating by this department. He no doubt deserved it. Oh, and by the way, Dan Harskin would become a member of the Ku Klux Klan, the Dallas Ku Klux Klan. With this preface repeat, repeat complete, the Klan readied itself for its formal introduction to Dallas. At 9 p.m. on May 21st, 1921, the streets of Dallas went dark. 
One by one, the figures of 789 men emerged from the old Majestic Theater building with the standard of the stars and stripes and the flaming cross leading the procession. Sporadically, black and white banners were raised and lowered. The signs carried the promise of the Klan status quo, white supremacy, pure womanhood, degenerates go, Dallas must be clean, our little girls must be uh, protected. And along the 45 minute parade, basically they were greeted by cheering crowds. Basically, the next morning, the Dallas Morning News received a note from the Klan where the note was uh, reflective of the purity campaign out to explore more traditional values. Not only was this reform one of the recruitment drives, but it also lent a level of respect to lower middle class men. This note, however, not only announced that the Klan had arrived to uphold the authority and dignity of the law, but also it was opposed to violence and lynching. After the, saying this, the note continued that it was even more opposed to the things that cause lynching and mob rule. Your sins will find you out. Be ye not deceived. And basically, Dallas uh, Clanburn, number 66, under the leadership of Hiram Evans, who was an East Texas dentist that operated on Main Street, the Klan room was close to his uh, office. Basically, the Klan was able to seduce many of Dallas's political, religious, and economic leaders. This added to the impression that the Klan's activities were legal because, I mean, respectable men were joining them. It was like, you know, a, a rotary club or a business group. And to a lot of lower middle class men who, you know, they had moved in from the countryside, they were in foreign surroundings, maybe they weren't making that much money, the Klan gave them a sense of belonging. <coughs> uh, now, of course, even though they said they didn't like violence or lynching, they were able to uh, infiltrate the Dallas police force. And once again, Sheriff Dan Harston was a Klan member. And John Moore was a white gentleman. He was arrested for the aggravated assault of a 12-year-old girl he was taken to jail by Sheriff Dan Harskin, where uh, his information was gathered. And sometime near midnight, a group between 15 and 20 masked men took more to the Trinity River bottoms, where he was horse whipped 10 times. Between beatings, the whip holder shouted, degenerates must go. And after being warned that he should, uh, should he return to Dallas, it would be the death of you. Moore caught a freight train after the flogging and was never seen in Dallas again. Well, then we get by the summer of uh, 1921. The Klan is a national phenomenon. Basically, they have 100,000 new members and with membership rates of $10 a head, the Klan had more than a, uh, yeah, a million dollars, which it invests. Simmons said there was so much money in sight that you could um, lay out almost any sorts of plans. Tyler and Clark gave a sense to the rise of racism and nationalism in the country.
Indeed, the New York World reported more than 252 Klan attacks in one year, including four murders, 41 floggings, 27 tar and featherings. A report was written that said that the Klan had become a menace to the peace and security of every section of the United States. Its evil and vicious possibilities are boundless. Well, if there's a big problem and government's got to do something about it, uh, they, they hold congressional hearings. And at these congressional hearings, there's a picture of it right there, basically Simmons is so flamboyant and theatrical that the group, the Congress, kind of goes along with them. and finds that he's not a threat. Well, what's the activity because of this? Membership jumps 20%. Indeed, Simmons says, Congress gave us the best advertising we ever got. Congress made us. But Simmons' days as the leader were uh, numbered. In Thanksgiving of 1922, at the National Convocation, I guess that's their, where they got together as a group, uh, Hiram Wesley Evans takes over the Klan, basically as a coup, but they give Simmons the title of Imperial Kilgrat, even though he has no power. Meanwhile, what about here in 1922 in uh, Dallas? By 1922, the Klan continued its exponential growth in Texas. Early 1922 applications for Klan membership averaged about 100 a day. In Dallas, however, punishment of those outside the Klan's uh, definition of virtue was seen with each of the 62 floggings that the Klan reinforced the moral uh, correction of uh, mob rule. I don't know why that Thanksgiving thing is there. But anyway, in response to the Klan, because basically the Klan had infiltrated the police uh, you know, city government, all this stuff. There was a group of about 3,000 that formed the Dallas County Citizens League that was going to try to fight the Klan. Well, did this worry the Dallas Klan? No. Just four days later, they had Klan Day at the Texas State Fairground. as well as other floggings and all that stuff. Uh, at this Klan meeting, uh, they initiated 1,125 members, raised more than $40,000 for a home for unwed mothers called Hope Cottage. And Hope Cottage is still in Dallas, even though it's no longer owned by the Ku Klux Klan. They had to sell it because they were going bankrupt. In the Democratic primary, Klan candidates won every local race, including judges. Yeah, like Dan Harston, who won sheriff. Shelby Cox was elected a district attorney. Earl Mayfield, the Klan's candidate, defeated James Ferguson by a two-to-one vote. And here in Dallas, uh, Zeke Marvin, a uh, guy who owned a bunch of drunk stores, was made Grand Dragon of uh, Clanburn 66. Oh, and by the way, Clanburn 66 was the largest Clanburn in the nation. Now, 
1923 is another year for a spectacle. An estimated 75,000 Klansmen from Klans all over Texas attended Klan Day at the Texas State Fair. The day concluded with an initiation ceremony that was hoped to gain 10,000 new members. A group of uh, 1,500 Klansmen attended the opening of Hope Cottage, which the Dallas Klan number 66 had donated more than $80,000 to its construction. And it's so funny. Uh, basically, at Klan Day at the fair, um, Some two men were arrested for allegedly assaulting a Klan's woman, and the flogging victim, one of the flogging victims, Joe Westbrook, went to the courts to seek justice. His wife and her friend were able to identify one of the floggers, and then Westbrook was able to identify one of the jurors as a member of the party who followed uh, who flogged him. To which, of course, fellow Klansman and district attorney Shelby Cox said, the accusation is preposterous. I know Mr. Noel well. Anyone who knows Mr. Noel will agree with me that Mr. Noel would never do such a thing. And, of course, they were found not guilty. In 1924, you have the Democratic Party start to distance themselves from the Klan. The Klan's candidate for governor was Judge Felix E. Robertson. Uh, against Miriam Ma Ferguson. And Ma Ferguson was elected as well as Dan Moody. And both these guys were very anti-Klan. Uh, but one guy was also elected who was named Skylar Marshall Jr. And he basically, he'd gone to World War I. I told you that he was the uh, commander of those troops, of the colored troops that had uh, rioted at Fort Logan when he was gone for a weekend because a cop basically was harassing them, forcing, they, not forcing them, but they were worried about what was going to happen to their uh, fellow soldier in jail. So they go and they grab rifles and everything, take it to the jail, demand to see the guy. And then they come back to uh, Fort Travis and a crowd of about 100 whites with guns start to attack them, and they shoot back. But anyway, Scott Marshall was called back out to Sam. They are taken to New Mexico. Now he decides he wants to be sheriff. He had a lot of land. His family had a lot of land out in Garland. And now he wants to become the sheriff. Well, so he's, he wins his election in 1924. He does a lot of good stuff of, of uh, destroying, uh, destroying, I can't think of it now. Oh, distilleries that people make moonshine in, uh, more than 300 gallons. Um, in Denton, he went in one time and, and basically faced a guy who uh, had a gun pointed at him. He was a very brave guy. Anyway, um, it was during this week that uh, the black terrors of Frank and Lorenzo Knoll, two brothers, had been captured. And even though their crime spree began with black on black crime, it largely went unnoticed by uh, police. But the murder of white and wealthy Ryan Atkins and the assault of his white girlfriend, Mary Steer, on Easter Sunday, 
and the murder of YWL Milstead and the assault upon Miss Mabel Berry were actions that pressed for capture and uh, society demanded justice and Dallas was already tense because of course we were over packed with visitors thanks to that Confederate reunion. And so basically starting at 8 o'clock, crowds are appearing, throwing bottles at the police officers. He only has 34 regular deputies with him, as well as 40 other people that he deputized. They call out the fire department, fire department number four, to lend trucks to basically shoot water hoses to uh, keep the crowds back, while the, the uh, phone lines in Dallas start getting deluged with calls, with fake uh, reports of fires to try to take the fire trucks away. And by midnight, the crowd is now numbering about 7,500, I believe, somewhere between five and 10,000. And he has 150 law officers, and that's it. And he's determined that the, um, that they will not break into the jail and that Franklin Lorenzo Knoll will have a justice. Um, anyway, there's a shootout where more than 150 bullets were fired. Indeed, three times uh, Scholar Marshall's hat got knocked off his head. There are bullet holes, other ones as close as uh, six feet away from him. While he was up man in the hose, they caught six people. Ma Ferguson, like I said, who had been um, a just elected governor, the next day, like at 5 a.m., he goes over to the crowd and says, look, we're all tired, you're not getting them, just go home. And the crowd starts to dissipate. Ma Ferguson, alarmed by the situation in Dallas, sends 300 soldiers of the National Guard up here as well as two Texas Rangers, Frank Hammer and Tom Hickman. Frank Hammer was the guy who was responsible for uh, Bonnie and Clyde, their capture later on. Tom Hickman uh, basically had been working in other towns, putting down riots and other uh, forms of spectacle by the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, and so basically uh, what happened was uh, he didn't tell anybody because uh, the uh, Shelby Cox, who was the DA, who was also a Klansman, he wanted the guys to be tried. He says, keep them here. We're going to press them with even more crimes. And basically uh, Marshall said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. At like three in the morning, the only guy he took with him was Hickman. And just him in the car and basically they got in that car without telling them anybody, and drove them to Huntsville, uh, where they were uh, to be executed. And they are just one of six sets of brothers that have been executed by the state of uh, Texas. Well, the guys, pretty much, they've broken the power of the Klan in Dallas. Um, Basically, by uh, 1926, Zeke Marvin reported that the Klan's membership in the state had fallen from 9,700 members, no, 97,000 members, down to just 18,000. And the membership of Dallas Klan, number 66, their membership had fallen from 13,000 members down to only 1,200. Uh, Scott R. Marshall, who did run for the position of sheriff again, he lost. Even though he was awarded a total of five medals, including one from England and one from the NAACP for his protection of the Knoll brothers, and after he lost, Marshall traveled first to Mexico, then to Matagorda County. 
And at Matagorda in the early 1930s, he and two friends drilled an oil well, which struck oil and continued to produce as late as 1982. His wife divorced him in 32, yet he remained very close to his son, Scott and Marshall III. Scott and Marshall IV is now uh, running an investment house here in Dallas. And um, he continued to hold on to his 130 acres of family farm uh, until he finally moved to University Park in 1969 where he died on April 10th, 1982. Shelby Cox, meanwhile, continued his legal profession. After finishing his second term as a district attorney, Cox became a justice on the Dallas County Criminal Court, a position he held until his retirement in 1966, and beyond membership in various Masonic and Rotary orders, Shelby Cox rose to the position of Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, which means he was the head guy in Texas of the Ku Klux Klan. And at 79 years old, he died in his apartment on October 22nd, 1967. But basically this was the beginning of the end for the Ku Klux Klan in Texas, which happened earlier than it did in the rest of the nation. Because in the Ku Klux Klan, as their power increased, so did their violence. I mean, they even commit violence uh, against women who were outside of pure womanhood beatings, whippings, and torture practiced on divorcees who later on remarried, or girls caught riding in automobiles with young men, and even women accused of immorality and failure to go to church. By 1928, Klan membership had fallen from a high of three to five million to fewer than a million. America pretty much grew tired of the extremism and violence. Old political allies moved away. Night rides drew public outcry in the South. And in the North, the Klan's alliances with the Nazis made many people move away. In 1944, the IRS filed a $685,000 lien for back taxes against them. So they had to sell most of their holdings. And you don't really see a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan uh, until the case of Brown v. Topeka, Board of Education. In the 50s that integrated public schools. And that, my friends, is that. It's 10.50. Even though that clock doesn't say it, it is. Does the clock on your computer say